Hi, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine Joint Replacement Education Session. We want to welcome you to our program, and here you can see photos of your surgeon, Dr. Kanuja, Dr. Sterling, Dr. Oni, or Dr. Zakria. Today, we're here to go over the process of getting a hip or knee joint replaced. Learn how to prepare for surgery, know what to expect while you're in the hospital and when you get home, and learn the role of physical therapy and other members of your healthcare team. Here we have a picture of a normal arthritic knee joint. And as you can see on the right-hand side, a picture of a knee joint that has osteoarthritis. You can see where the cartilage and the joint space becomes thin and your bones start to rub together. This is very painful and this is when you decide that you need to have knee implant surgery. In a total knee replacement, metal caps are placed on each end of the bone. Your bones smooth down, metal caps are placed, and in between where your joint space used to be that we've lost over the years, a plastic piece is inserted. This is a high molecular weight polyethylene. What you cannot see in the picture on the bottom part of your knee bone is a small stem that attaches with the implant and that's there for stability. Once these pieces are placed on each end of your bone, smooth metal and plastic rub together instead of the worn out knee. In the arthritic hip joint, you can see on the left hand side a picture of a normal joint space. It's light blue with, you can see the fluid and the ball and socket. On the left side, you can see where the bone is arthritic and starts to break down. And the same concept applies. Your bones start to rub together and this is very painful and then it is decided that you need a new artificial hip implanted. With total hip replacement, the damaged parts of your hip are removed and replaced with metal and plastic implants. Bone grows into the rough surface of the metal implants. You can see in the picture kind of a lightish gray. That is a very rough surface on the implant. Your bone will eventually grow into this for more stability. This could take months. Preparing for your surgery. We want to help you today understand the process of getting yourself ready for surgery. There are many things that we would like you to do for clearance. One of the first things after you've scheduled your surgical date is set up a, an examination with your primary care doctor. When you call to make your appointment with them, you want to let them know that this is for a pre-op examination. There's nothing that you need to bring to this appointment. Once you've scheduled your surgical date, the medical office coordinator whom you spoke with will then fax a form to your doctor's office instructing them of what needs to be done or ordered. At this visit, you can expect to have a history and physical, an EKG, and blood work ordered. This is only good for 30 days. You should make your first pre-op examination appointment 15 to 30 days outside of your surgical window. We would like to have your pre-ops that you've had done and your clearance and the results of all your blood work sent to our office two weeks prior to your surgical date. The next thing that we would like you to do is be cleared by your dentist. You should make an appointment with your dentist. There is a form that your dentist can fill out that tells us that you're free of infection and that there's no outstanding dental work that needs to be completed. This form should be signed by your dentist. We are worried about infection if you have surgery. So you're going to hear this a lot in this presentation. So pre-op examination by your doctor, 15 to 30 days outside of your surgical date. The results should be faxed to us within two weeks of your surgery. And you should get dental clearance by your dentist this form should be filled out and also sent to our office. 
Once that form is filled out by your dentist, it is good for six months. Please monitor your skin closely as this can be a high risk of infection. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. Medications. There are certain medications that need to be stopped prior to your surgery. These include NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Examples of these are ibuprofen, Motrin. Some prescription NSAIDs are called meloxicam. You should stop taking these at least 10 days prior to your surgery. You should get your team ready. Choose a coach. This can be a family member, a friend, anybody that you choose to help you with your surgical procedure afterwards. You should have somebody that will be there to be at the hospital with you if possible, even if they have to hold your belongings, and especially when you come home for surgery. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Getting strong before your surgery. Use low impact exercise equipment, such as an elliptical trainer or bike. Swimming is great if you have access to a pool. You've seen pictures of exercises in your educational binder that you received at your clinic visit with your surgeon. We don't expect you to do those exercises prior to surgery. We understand that it can be very painful. We do expect you to familiarize yourself with them and do those after surgery. The physical therapist in the hospital after your surgery will work with you and teach you how many of these you should do when you're at home and how many times a day. It would be a good idea to think about your arms as opposed to your legs and increase your arms and upper body strength by lifting weights. Light weights are fine. And always remember to work within your pain-free range. As a part of infection prevention and proper wound healing after surgery. At Johns Hopkins Hip and Knee Replacement Program, we've decided quitting nicotine is essential for a successful surgery. Doing so will promote optimal lung expansion and circulation, improve bone healing, reduce the rate of infection, and most importantly, improve wound healing. After surgery, it will be very important that your wound heals properly. When you use nicotine products, this affects blood circulation and proper circulation needed to get to your wound for healing. Your surgery will be canceled if you do not quit. Please contact us for more information about this if you are a nicotine user, and we will talk you through that. Your diet. Develop and maintain healthy eating habits. You should keep your bones healthy by eating high calcium and high protein foods. Choose low fat and low sodium foods. Limit sweets. Get adequate amounts of fiber every day. After surgery, you could be constipated. Including fiber in your diet can help with this. Achieve a healthy weight. Added pressure onto your new joint can hurt you. So we'd like you to achieve a healthy weight and eat healthy. Building your team. This is where we talk about choosing a coach. Family, friends, neighbors, reach out, let people that you associate with know that you're having surgery. You may need help at different times. You, would, you may need help for arranging help with shopping, housework, cooking, running errands. Do you have a birthday party coming up, graduation? something that you may need to go out to the store and get. If you can do these things prior to surgery, that would be helpful to you. Or after surgery, you, maybe you can have your coach go with you to make sure you're safe. You will be functional after surgery. You will be able to walk around and go to the store. We do worry about falling and being in large crowded areas right away after surgery. So any of these things that you can limit and do prior to coming in for surgery will help. Now we'll talk about what to bring to the hospital and what's going to happen for your surgery in the hospital. Bring as least as possible. Please leave valuables at home if possible. You should always have a photo identification any insurance and prescription cards, 
any toiletries that you prefer to use, we can always help you provide these at the hospital. We have toiletries that you can use, but if you'd like to bring your own, that's fine. Wear loose clothing to the hospital. You will be working with occupational therapists after surgery. One of the things that they have you do is get dressed. So please wear loose clothing, something that's easy for you to get on. You could be a little swollen after surgery. So anything that fits tightly now before surgery may be even tighter and harder to get on after surgery. Flat, closed back shoes are important. You're going to be walking and exercising with physical therapists after your surgery. You wanna make sure that you have a good rubber soled shoe and that your heel is fully closed. Any dentures, hearing aids, and glasses, please bring those to the hospital and wear them. We do not want you to wear contacts in the hospital for, surger for the surgical procedure. Glasses are preferred. Once again, a little more about infection. We spoke earlier about obtaining a dental clearance by your dentist. This form should be signed and sent to your doctor. It is extremely important that you have good dental health prior to joint replacement. We have hundreds of bacteria in our mouth. Some are good, some are bad. If you've been cut or bacteria gets into your bloodstream, one of the risks of this is that your implant could get infected. This is foreign in your body. Your body doesn't know what that is. So if bacteria travels through your bloodstream, there's a possibility that it could affect the joint space. So prior to coming in for this surgery, we would like to decrease your risk of infection. So obtain dental clearance. Monitor your skin. Avoid any scratches, bruises, sunburn, rashes, and any open areas, especially anything that's draining. Please, if you have any questions about your skin, call our office, we'll go over it. The mupirocin ointment. You should have received a prescription by your surgeon when you decided to have your surgery. This ointment is prescribed and it should have been sent to your pharmacy. It's in a tube and you should start using it five days prior to your surgery. If you refer to your educational binder that you received in the, at the surgical visit, there's an infection prevention guide. It's about three pages long. The first page of that guide you can refer to for instructions on how to use the mupirocin ointment correctly. This ointment should be placed in each nostril twice a day. Preoperative cleansing. Along with the nasal ointment to help decrease any bacteria in your nasal passages, you have received wipes. These two sets of chlorhexidine wipes are medicated and they help reduce bacteria on the skin that could cause an infection. On the day before surgery, use the first set of wipes two hours after a shower. It's important to shower, clean your skin, and then dry fully when you get out of the shower and then use your wipes. You can refer to that infection prevention guide that I just mentioned. It's on the second and third page of that guide. Use the second set of wipes the morning of surgery. Please remember, you should only shower the night before your surgery. Do not shower again until after your surgery. So the morning of surgery, when you use the second set of wipes, you should just apply the wipes on your dry skin. The reason we don't want you to shower the morning of surgery is because you would wipe and wash off everything that you applied the night before. This medicine on the wipes could be ir very irritating to your skin if you have a history of eczema or you're very easily, you very easily can get a rash. You may want to test, you may want to test a small area of your skin to see if you react. Most people don't, but if you have a history of skin eczema, you may want to try using the wipes first in a small area. Now we'll talk about when you get the call to arrive to the hospital. A nurse from our ambulatory surgery unit will call you two business days prior to surgery. 
Once again, she'll call you two business days prior to surgery. The nurse will want to speak to the patient. The nurse is going to go over what you should eat and drink and when to stop prior to surgery and what medications to take the morning of surgery. She's going to give you your arrival time. The nurse will go over what to bring, what not to bring to the hospital. They will mention wearing contacts as opposed to glasses and ask if there's been any changes in your physical condition, such as a cough, fever, cold, sore throat. This is a good time to let that nurse know if there's been any changes. When you arrive to the hospital, you will report to the third floor surgery registration suite. You will be checked into the hospital and you will meet your nurse. They will give you a gown and a name band. So you'll change out of your clothes that you wore in and you'll wear a hospital gown and then and the name band will be like a barcode. So when you're given medications, this will be scanned. They will ask you questions. They're going to explain things. And at this point, your family is allowed to be with you. An IV will be started. This is a intravenous line that you will receive medications through since you cannot eat or drink. You will also meet your anesthesiologist. Your anesthesiologist will talk to you about your anesthesia, what will happen, what medications they will administer. You will sign consent with your anesthesiologist just as you did with your surgeon when you consented for surgery. This is a really good time to ask any questions you may have about your anesthesia. We usually prefer to use spinal anesthesia, but there are many other options for you if that is not feasible. You will also meet your surgeon. The surgeon will mark your operative leg. At this time, you should give your family members any valuables or belongings that you brought with you, and they will be escorted to the family waiting room. In the operating room, it is cold. We keep it that way to limit any bacterial growth. The area is very busy. There are many people, lots of supplies. Your body area will be draped. Your skin will be cleansed again and anesthesia will begin. Your surgery could last two to three hours. After surgery, you will spend time in our post-anesthesia care unit. The time spent in the recovery room varies. It could be one hour, it could be more. You will be waiting for your room to get ready and they will let you know how long it will be. At this time, family may be able to visit after you are moved to a hospital room. Also, in post-anesthesia care, after surgery, you can expect to be on a continuous heart monitor. We will work with pain control. We want your pain to be controlled. If you have any issues or you feel that your medicine's not working, please let your nurse know. You will be administered IV fluids, and also nausea medicine is available if needed. Your nurse will explain your dressings, your compression stockings, compression devices, any tubes, wires, and medicines. Your anesthesiologist will decide when you're ready to be moved to a hospital room. Once you're moved to the hospital room, this is where you will be at until you're discharged from the hospital and your family is welcome to visit. Our hospital room is located on the WENS orthopedic unit. You will have close monitoring by nursing staff. Vital signs are taken every four hours or as needed. Blood draws usually occur very early in the morning, sometimes 4 a.m. Your doctors need to have their blood results when they round and see you in the morning. Your care team usually rounds early, as early as 6 a.m. So this is why we blood draw the blood early. Your physician team will visit in the morning. You may or may not see your surgeon, but his care team is available to answer any questions you may have. 
pain management. This is very important to us that your pain is correctly managed. Please speak up if it is not. We always have other options of pain control that we can try if the first one doesn't work. Your pain management will begin before surgery and it will continue until you are discharged. We usually give a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. This is what I mentioned earlier, like an ibuprofen or a Motrin. Usually when you're discharged from the hospital, you are discharged with a prescription NSAID. This helps with any inflammation that you may have. If you cannot take this kind of medication, you will not be prescribed this medication. We also like you to take acetaminophen, or you may know it as Tylenol, and also a narcotic. Not everybody can take these three medications. If you can't, we will make and we have alternatives. You will get your prescriptions at discharge. Usually our nurse can drop off your medications at our outpatient pharmacy where it will be available for you to pick up on discharge. This is your option if you'd like to do this. You may need to bring in a prescription card in order to have this picked up. You could also maybe plan on having petty cash for your copay for your pharmaceuticals, or they take debit card or credit card as well. Blood clot prevention. You will have to wear anti-embolism stockings after surgery. This is what I was saying earlier that the nurse would explain the stockings and the compression devices. These anti-embolism stockings will be on your legs after surgery. They will be on both legs. This helps prevent blood clots. You will have to wear these stockings for 30 days after surgery daily. These stockings have to be worn for four weeks during the day and you may remove them at night before you go to bed. They work best when pressure is on the legs like standing up. So you don't need to wear them at night. This helps with blood flow in order to help prevent blood clots. Sequential compression devices or SCD. This is a machine that will be wrapped around your leg. It's very light like a blood pressure cuff and there's long tubes and wires that go to the mechanical device that operates it. This is located on the end of your hospital bed and these go around, like I said, like a Velcro pressure cuff around your anti-embolism stockings. You will only have to wear that device while you're in the hospital and laying in bed. One of the most important things after surgery is early mobility. We want you up and moving as early as possible. We will, the nurses, the care team, physical therapy, will work with you to get you up and moving as soon as possible after surgery. Please don't do this by yourself. Post-operative medications such as aspirin or other blood thinners are also used to help prevent blood clots. One of the most common medicine that we use after surgery is aspirin. Other blood thinners are used if you cannot take aspirin or if you are already taking a blood thinner such as Coumadin or Xarelto prior to having your surgery. We will just continue your blood thinner that you were taking before surgery. Our inpatient orthopedic care team consists of nurse practitioners, physician assistants, resident physicians, orthopedic fellows, and nurses. These are all part of your care team and will be assisting at some point in your care in the hospital. We have case managers on the orthopedic floor. They ensure safe discharge and will make sure that you're discharged with the right equipment. Social workers help coordinate transfers to rehabilitation facilities if needed. Physical therapy. This is extremely important after joint replacement. One of the reasons that we have you cleared by your primary care doctor is to make sure that you can adequately complete physical therapy after surgery. This promotes early and safe mobility. They will give you a rehabilitation plan. They work with your pain management. 
They will let you know any precautions or restrictions that you may have after your surgery. And our physical therapy team also is in charge of any discharge recommendations. We recommend prior to surgery that you schedule your first physical therapy appointment for after surgery. For instance, if your surgery is on a Monday, you should set up your first physical therapy appointment Thursday or Friday after your surgery. Most patients have surgery and are discharged in one to two days. You should already have your physical therapy appointment set up prior to coming in for your surgery because it can be extremely difficult to call at the last minute and be put on their schedule. These are some pictures of exercises that you could start now, work within your pain-free range, and you will also be instructed and taught how to do these after surgery as well. Straight leg raises, buttock contractions. This helps strengthen your muscles and helps increase blood flow. Ankle pumps, very easy to do, moving your ankle back and forth, kind of like pressing a gas pedal in a car. Hip abductions, heel slides. Other members of your team include occupational therapists. These therapists will work with you alongside with physical therapists. The difference between occupational therapy is that they focus more on your activities of daily living. They will help you with things such as showering and bathing after surgery, and even teach you the proper and safe way to put on your compression hose. They may go over if your home is safe for your return. Some of the things that they may suggest are remove rugs so you don't fall. Do you have night lights? If you have to get up and use the bathroom in the middle of the night, you wanna make sure you have adequate lighting. These are some of the things that they'll go over with you but you can certainly start that now. Any assistive devices that are needed, they will help you receive those before you go home from the hospital. Some examples are a leg lifter, a sock device, now we'll talk about discharge. Typically, one to two days after surgery is normally when you'll be discharged. Most people have surgery and are discharged the next day. Most people are discharged home and we expect them to start outpatient physical therapy. Of course, your discharge is determined by how well you're doing, how well you're walking, how well your pain is controlled. We don't want you nauseated. We want you eating and drinking. You may not have too much of an appetite, but you shouldn't be nauseated. And like I said, most people go home after their hospital stay. If further rehabilitation is needed, our care management staff will assist you. In-home physical therapy is where a physical therapist comes to your house. This can be necessary if you are homebound. If you are, they are very limited in their range of treatments that can be offered in your home. Your surgeon prefers that you get out of the house, get some sunshine, and go out to outpatient physical therapy and work in their gym. But if in-home physical therapy is needed, it's not often that it's needed, but if it is, we will order that for you and take care of setting that up. Our case management and our social workers help set that up for you. What they don't set up is your outpatient physical therapy. In-home physical therapy, they will help you set up before you leave the hospital. Outpatient physical therapy is recommended two to three times per week possibly for 10 to 12 weeks after surgery. They have specialized equipment to improve your mobility. You should select a therapy site at least two weeks prior to surgery and schedule your first appointment. Consider travel time and visit before a surgery. You may require a copayment by your insurance. You could check into these things now. One of the things that I mentioned earlier about a coach helping you you're going to be restricted from driving the first couple of weeks after surgery. You want to consider who's going to be driving you to physical therapy and, and picking you up. Care of your incision. After surgery, you will have an incision that will be closed with dissolvable sutures. 
over your incision, there will be a dressing. It looks similar to this picture. It is called an Aquacel dressing. It should stay over your incision for seven days. On the seventh day, you can remove it. Under your dressing, you should see dissolvable sutures. You do not have to redress your incision. That means you don't have to put on another dressing over top of your incision. Once this original surgical dressing is removed, your incision can stay open to air. We do ask that you do not shower for up to 48 hours after your original dressing is removed. This will also be in your discharge instructions as well if you need to refer to it later. Sutures are most commonly used to close your incision. They're dissolvable and it could take up to four weeks for them to fully dissolve. At each end of the incision where the sutures are tied, there are little knots at the end of your wound which you can feel sticking out of the incision. They will fall off eventually as the sutures under your skin dissolve and break attachment with those suture knots. Staples are rarely used. If you see staples under your incision, just know that staples should be removed two weeks after surgery. You should already have an appointment set up for staple removal if this is used. This is at the discretion of your surgeon after surgery. When to call the doctor. If you feel that anything is wrong, you should always call our office and we'll help you. We'll figure out what's going on. If you have shortness of breath or chest pain, please call 911. These could be signs of a blood clot that has dislodged and moved to your lungs or your heart. If you have a fever of more than 101.5 degrees, if you have increasing wound redness, drainage and swelling that is very different from your normal after the surgery, please give us a call. Any drainage that is yellow or foul smelling, any increased pain could be a sign of infection. It is normal after surgery to have a slight temperature it is normal around your incision and your wound to have some, some redness. It could be pink, depending on your skin color. This is normal. This is increased blood flow to your incision to help with healing. There could even be a little bit of drainage and we do anticipate swelling after surgery. But if this increases and becomes very red and very sw swollen, please call us and we'll triage it and we may need to see you in the office. If you have calf pain, tightness, redness, or swelling in your calf area that continues to worsen, we could be worried about a blood clot forming. Please call us and we'll go over that with you. Certain activities are restricted after surgery. One of them would be driving. Usually you can get back to driving about four weeks after surgery, but you should wait until your provider clears you at your four-week post-operative visit. Sports gradually, a couple months after surgery. Hobbies as you feel able. Sex when you're comfortable. Please talk about this with your provider at your four-week post-operative visit. Follow-up clinic visits should be scheduled four weeks after surgery, three months after surgery, and one year after surgery. Patient reported outcome surveys are asked to be completed prior to surgery, and we will ask you to complete another survey to see how you're doing after surgery. You may have received or will receive patient education modules that, you, that will be delivered through your email. Medical follow-up as needed with your doctors. Just make sure you follow up with your primary care doctor or any other specialist after surgery. Dental care. We do ask for the first two years following surgery that you premedicate yourself prior to any dental visit, especially cleanings. An antibiotic needs to be taken one hour prior to dental care. If your dentist needs further recommendations, please contact our office and we'd be happy to send a letter of recommendation. 
Your dentist usually prescribes this antibiotic. Some dentists may want you to do this for the rest of your life. We do ask that you take an antibiotic for the first two years after surgery and for a lifetime of more invasive procedures. This would include, for example, a root canal or a deep scaling, something that's more invasive. We wanna wish you good luck with surgery. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact our office. We're here if you need us. Try and relax and have positive thinking.